Well, take your Bibles this morning. If you have them, turn to the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, chapter number 25. Chapter 25. Last week we really got into the heart of our series that we're calling Shift. And I I began our time together with a question that I want to pose to you once again this morning, and that is this, what if I were to tell you that God has extraordinary plans in store for your life? What if I were to tell you that the perfect, sovereign, holy, all-powerful God is getting ready to shift you to a whole new level of life and power and joy and spiritual productivity. Now comes the question, if I were to tell you that God is going to do all that with you, would you dare to believe it? Would you dare to embrace it? I would imagine there are a number of folks here this morning that would say, yes, preacher, I believe God has great things in store for my life. I believe, I've felt for a long time he wants to do the extraordinary with me. And I believe very probably if we were to group those people up and put them on one side of the room, very probably they would be among the youngest members of this congregation. I would imagine, however, that most of us, If asked, do you believe God wants to shift you to a whole new level? Do you believe he's going to do something extraordinary with you? I think most of us would answer something like this. Well, I hope he is. I mean, I know he can, and I'd certainly like him to, but I'm not so sure he will. I think there are two reasons for that kind of doubt about our future and God's intention in it. The first one, quite frankly, is our past performance. I think a whole lot of us would say, listen, I know God can use people who yield their life to him. I know he can bless people who obey his commandments and avoid the things that he condemns. And pastor, I've tried. There have been moments in my life points at youth camp and times when I came down to an altar weeping. There have been moments all along the way where I resolved, I'm going to be different. I'm going to be better. God, I am going to read my Bible more and get involved in church and start telling my neighbors and coworkers and family about Christ. And God, there's some stuff in my life that's got to go. There's some temperaments that I want to do better with. There's maybe some addictions in my life, some things that I turn to in times of turmoil other than you that have got to go. I tried to be better, but pastor, the truth is I have found this pattern. Whenever I try to do good, there's this evil tendency to drift back. My resolutions last maybe a couple of months but I keep doing wrong. There's all these things God's told me to do that I'm not doing. And there's all these things he's told me to avoid that I'm not avoiding. So pastor, based on my past performance, do I believe that God has these amazing things in store for me? He could, but I doubt that he does. And the second reason that many of us would have that kind of answer is frankly our present circumstances. Preacher, I don't see that blessing of God, particularly on my life, if the truth be known, I'm stuck. I'm stuck in my marriage. I'm stuck in some habit. My finances are stuck. I'm stuck in life. I'm stuck at a dead-end job. And surely if God's blessing were on my life, I mean, if he were really thrilled about doing something amazing with me, I wouldn't be caught in the traps that I'm in now. So you ask me if I think he's going to do the extraordinary with me, I sure wish he would, but I just don't know. Here's the thing, friend. Before we go one step further, I don't know what your week this week has looked like. I don't know what maybe you're enduring by way of some problems and temptations and trials and maybe family issues. But if you get one thing I say this morning, I pray the Holy Spirit would let your heart latch on to this. We sang about it all morning, whether we knew it or not. And that is this. God is not nearly so interested in your behavior and winning that to him as he is in winning your heart to him. You say, you're you're saying that God's not interested in my behavior? No, friend, he's very interested in your behavior, but God knows that when he wins your heart, your behavior follows afterward. 
So here's the thing. God's not interested in tweaking your actions. God is interested in changing your heart. God's not interested in simply modifying your behavior. God wants to go down to the core of you, to what you love, to what your life is wrapped around, to what is so dear to you that you'll invest your existence in it. God wants to get down to the core of who you are, and he wants to do what no one in this universe can do for you other than him. He wants to change your heart. And here's the thing that I'm finding out in this journey as a Christian, in this this pathway years in now as a follower of Jesus Christ. We know all about trying to tweak somebody's behavior. We do that with students. We do that with workers. We do that with pets. We reward good behavior and we punish bad behavior. Let me just be honest with you. You're not God's pet. You are his child And God is dead set on changing your heart and his method for changing your heart is not simply blessing you when you're doing good and disciplining you when you're doing bad. He is going to take you on a journey, friend. And it will be years in the making. And it will include blessings and it will include incredibly hard times where God is going to change you, as we sung about this morning, from the inside out. You see, we're born saying, I want to build my kingdom, my dream, my business, my reputation, my priorities. I want to build my kingdom for my glory, and I want to do it by my power. You know where God's going to take you before this is all said and done in a work that only he can do? He's going to take you from your little kingdom to being in love with his kingdom and his mission. He's going to take you from living for your glory to living for his glory. He's going to take you from trying to do it all by your power to trusting in his power. And this morning, that's precisely what I want to talk to you about. I want to bring you a message entitled, Jacob, A Shift in Power. Last week we saw Abraham, this ordinary man with an ordinary wife and an ordinary dream and God came calling one day and said Abram I'm going to change your name I'm going to change your future I'm going to change your heart but God didn't do it immediately God took 25 years of putting this individual Abram in just the right circumstances alongside just the right people in just the right scenarios where he could show Abram what is where his heart really was And God could win that man's heart. Well, this morning we're going to meet a new individual and find God working in him in a very particular way. There's a book in my library by a guy named Alan Redpath. And years ago I read this quote and it's stuck with me ever since. Here's what Redpath said. Most of us, God forgive us, are too big for God to use. We're too full of our own schemes and our own way of doing things. God has to humble us and break us and empty us. So low indeed must God make us that we need every word of encouragement from heaven to enable us to take on the job and dare to go forward in the will of God. The world speaks about the survival of the fittest, but God gives power to the faint. God gives might to those who have no strength. God perfects his strength in our weakness. I want to talk this morning about how God will take a man or woman or boy or girl from this place where we think, I can do it. I can make it happen. I can manipulate the circumstances and situations of my life. I can turn the people in my life the direction they ought to go. How God will take us from trying to live by our power to living quite truly by his strength. Genesis chapter 25 and verse number 21. We're going to look at this kind of biographically in the lives of individuals that God looked down and shifted them into a whole new phase of existence. How many of you with me this morning say amen? Genesis 25 verse 21. 
And this begins with the son of Isaac, the promised son now has been born. He's grown up. He has a beautiful wife named Rebecca, who is barren, unable to have children. We've heard of that before with Abram in his own case. But now some amazing news. Verse 21. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children, notice she is pregnant with twins, struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? Or in other words, if all is well, if this is a healthy pregnancy, what is happening? And she went to inquire of the Lord. God, there's something physically going on here. There's turmoil going on within my womb. Verse 23, and the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other, now get this, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now, I want you to get what a profound statement that was. God says, Rebecca, I've looked down upon you. I've allowed you to be pregnant. And now these two children in your womb that are fighting, that are wrestling, and you're feeling all this pain and discomfort because of what's going on. Let me tell you what's going on. There are the progenitors, the heads of two nations inside your womb, and they are struggling And God says something amazing. He says, listen, this is going to be a different situation than normal. The elder child is going to serve the younger child. Let me tell you why that was unusual. In Hebrew culture, the eldest was entitled to the lion's share of all the blessings. Quite literally, they were the favored child. That oldest son got a double share of the inheritance. That oldest son, when the father died, he became head of the family. He became priest for the family. When the father formalized his blessing on that eldest son a little bit later in his childhood, that was absolutely saying, you're the favored one. But in this case, God is saying, I'm going to switch all that. I'm going to make the youngest the favored son. I'm going to treat the youngest like the eldest. And here's the thing. If we go on in our scripture, and here in just a few moments, we're going to meet that youngest son. God had more to say to this individual as he was growing up. In Genesis 28, let me read it to you. God appeared to this youngest son and said this to him. I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. In thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee. I will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and I will bring thee again into this land for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. In other words... Hey, youngest son, I'm not just going to give you the blessing in your family. I'm going to give you the blessing I promised to Abraham. I'm going to make a nation out of you that is going to cover the earth. I'm going to bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. He had this amazing destiny promised by Almighty God. But here's where the story gets interesting. Genesis 25, 24. Look here. Let's continue She's just found out why they're wrestling in her womb. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment. I love that so much. (laughs) Every time I read that. You may not giggle when you read the Bible, but when I read that, I almost always do. He came out red all over like a hairy garment, like a red fur coat, and they called his name Esau, which in the Hebrew literally means hairy. How's that for you are born as hairy as can be, so they name you Harry? You know, Johnny Cash sang about a boy named Sue. I'm not sure Esau had it any easier. Verse 26, and after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. Esau was named Harry for this physical characteristic, 
Jacob was named for a different characteristic. The Hebrew name Jacob literally means he that takes by the heel. It means manipulator. It means trickster. It means one who takes another's rightful place. Remember I told you last week to the the Hebrews, names meant a whole lot. I believe they spent a lot of their time praying about God. What do I name this child? Because your name was so tied up with your destiny. Your name was so tied up with your identity. And I want to tell you from the womb, this individual was already trying to pull ahead of his brother. He was already trying to claw his way onto planet Earth and get ahead from the womb. And for the next number of years of his life, Jacob, the manipulator, Jacob, the cheat, Jacob, the trickster, is going to live up to his name. He's got a destiny promised by God, but he's going to do what so many of us do every day. He's going to try and help God make it come true. He is going to claw and scratch and manipulate and do his best to control his circumstances. And the results are going to be devastating. We find three great examples of how Jacob was the trickster. In chapter 25, we find the birthright. The Bible tells us very plainly that Esau was a sportsman, an athlete. Esau, I believe, was an extrovert. He was the guy walking the halls of the high school with the letter jacket on, the one that all the girls wanted to date, the one that all the boys wanted to be. Esau was strong. He was a hunter, and his daddy Isaac favored him above all others. He loved Esau, and he loved the fact that Esau was tough and rough, and Esau hunted. And Jake and Isaac loved to eat of the meat that Esau brought home from his frequent hunting trips. We get a much different picture of Jacob. Jacob was what you might call an endorsement. Jacob was intellectual. Some might have thought Jacob to be soft. He was a thinker and a planner. And we find that Jacob's mother favored him above his older brother. By the way, what a devastating thing when parents favor one child over another. Isaac has now grown old. Isaac is preparing to give the blessing. But before that ever comes, Jacob's got a plan. Esau comes in from the field one day and he's been out hunting And he's been gone for a long time, and I guess he didn't get anything. He's absolutely starving to death. And Jacob is there, and he's prepared these red lentils. I don't know a whole lot about red lentils. Apparently that, even today, is considered a delicacy over there. Let's just call it chili. Okay? We have a chili cook-off here at Calvary, and we have some amazing chilies come in. Well, Jacob has prepared a whole pot of chili, and Esau comes in from the field, and he's hungry, and he's, almost, he's faint, and he says, Jacob, give me some of that chili. I'm going to die if I don't eat something. And Jacob says, all right, Esau, you give me your birthright, and I'll give you some chili. You give me the promise of double share of the inheritance and being the favored son. You give me your status as the head of the household and I'll give you some chili. And I don't know if there was much of an argument. What we do know is the New Testament tells us Esau didn't think a whole lot of the birthright anyway. It was way off in the future. He was living in the now. He says, what good is my birthright going to do me if I starve to death? Absolutely. I don't care. Here you go. And he gives him the chili And the Bible says that Esau despises, neglects, thinks lightly of his birthright. And here we see the beginning of Jacob trying to make it happen. Didn't God already promise you? Didn't your mom already tell you that you were going to have the birthright? You were going to be treated this way? Yeah, but Jacob's got to make it happen. We find now that Isaac's getting old. 
And the time is drawing near for him to issue the blessing in chapter 27. And in his mind, that is going to the eldest son, to Esau. He tells his son, go out to the field, go hunting, prepare me that meat I really like. And you come back, and I'm going to lay my hands on you, and I'm going to give you this blessing as the eldest son. And so he goes off hunting, and Jacob and his mama start scheming. By the way, Jacob, if he has this conniving, manipulative thing from birth, guess who had it first? Mama. She did her share of that, and apparently she passed the nature on to him because she says, hey, I'm going to help you get the blessing in your brother's place. And we find that Jacob puts on Esau's robe so he'll smell like him. And again, in one of the most humorous things in the Old Testament, he says, but wait a minute, daddy's going to draw me near, he's going to feel me, and I don't feel like Esau, I'm a smooth man. And so mama says, well, yeah, put this goat hair on, and then he'll feel you and he'll think you're Esau. How hairy was this guy? How much of a Sasquatch was this guy walking in from the field? The goat hair feels like that, but sure enough, he puts on the robe, mama cooks up some meat, he puts the hair on him, and he comes before his dad, and his father says, your voice sounds like Jacob's. No, I'm Esau. Well, you do smell like Esau. You do smell like, uh, you do feel like Esau. And eats the meat, and he puts the blessing, he prays the blessing on the youngest son in the oldest son's place. And now Esau comes back from his hunt, and he says, all right, daddy, I got the food, give me the blessing, I'm ready for it, I'm ready to move forward, I know I'm the oldest son, I can't wait for what you're going to give me, because now it means something to him. And the Bible says that Isaac just starts shaking. I've already given away the blessing. Given it away to who? I guess I must have given it away to your younger brother. And Esau, the Bible says, cries aloud and says, Daddy, don't you have more than one blessing? Can't you bless me too? Son, I've given him the blessing. It can't be undone. And now Esau in his heart says, I may have lost everything I've got to him, but he's going to lose something too. As soon as my daddy passes away, Jacob's dead. I'm going to take his life for what he's done. And we say, Jacob, why are you doing this? Didn't God already promise you? Didn't he already tell you that the eldest was going to serve the youngest? Why are you manipulating? Why are you trying to make it come true? But he is. And so here's what we find. By Genesis chapter number 30, Jacob and his mom have figured out he's got to go. He's got to get out of the country. They kind of concoct a story so that Isaac will believe it about, we want him to marry a different kind of girl than the girls around here. And Jacob leaves out. And if you read in the text, he has this amazing experience of God's presence and names the place Bethel, house of God, where he meets God. And he heads out toward a family member's place called Laban. And he goes and stays with Laban. And it's an amazing, beautiful story if you'll read it. We don't have time to go through all the facts of what happens. But here's what we do find. Jacob finds uh, Laban's daughter, Rebekah, who is absolutely gorgeous. She's beautiful. He wants to marry her. She's the second daughter. He says, I'll work seven years for you, Laban, if I can have your daughter to marry. And he says, absolutely. But then he gives Jacob the oldest daughter in kind of a twist around shifty thing at the end and says, in our country, you got to marry the oldest before the youngest. But if you work seven more years for me, we'll work this thing out. And so Jacob serves for this long stretch of years, serves in Laban's house. And here's the deal. Didn't God tell Jacob, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to grow your family, I'm going to prosper you, I'm going to protect you? Yes. But Jacob determines that he is going to cheat his own family member who did cheat him. But he is going to use this process of selective breeding to literally steal away Laban's cattle, Laban's wealth. And Jacob, the Bible says in Genesis 30, 43, increased exceedingly. He had much cattle and maidservants and men servants and camels and donkeys. Now before we go any further, listen. Years have gone by here, and we're learning about the character of this individual. Jacob, manipulator, trickster. And he is consistently 
stepping into another's rightful place, but may I suggest to you, he is not stepping into Esau's rightful place. He's not stepping into Laban's rightful place. He's stepping into God's rightful place by his own self-sufficiency, by his own independent efforts. He is trying to be God. Frank, can I just tell you, I've said it from this pulpit before, men make lousy gods. We are terrible at it. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you a Jacob? Are you a manipulator? Are you trying to control the people and circumstances of your life? Are you stepping in front of Almighty God and trying to do what only He can do? Some of you who have terribly difficult situations in your family, are you trying to manipulate those individuals into doing what you think they should? Some of you who have problems at work or with your money, are you constantly got another scheme, some other way? Your, mo- your mantra in life would be, the Lord helps those who help themselves. I'll say my prayers, but I'll also do my business. I'll make this happen. Let me just be real honest with you. Functionally, some of you who are not trying to control your circumstances are trying to control your circumstances in another way, and that way is called worry. You know what worry is? God, I can't trust you with this. I must bear it. I must take it. I must figure out a way to deal with it. Are you a Jacob? A.W. Tozer, if you've been at our church any time at all, you know he's one of my favorite authors. He said this, and I want to share it with you this morning. Jacob was the wily old heel catcher whose very strength was to him a near fatal weakness. For two-thirds of his life, he had carried in his nature something hard and unconquered. He was a shrewd, intelligent old master of applied psychology learned the hard way. The picture he presented was not a pretty one. He was a vessel marred in the making. Listen, his hope, his only hope, lay in his own defeat. This he did not know at the setting of that day, setting of the sun on that day. But he would learn it before the sun rose. Friends, let me be real honest with you. Somebody said this to me quite some time ago. When you are out in the midst of the ocean and you are drowning and a lifeguard comes to rescue you, the worst thing you can possibly do is try to save yourself. You will pull him under with you. The only thing you can do is let go and let that Savior deliver you. I want to tell you something, listen, there are people perhaps in this congregation today who are not on their way to heaven and are on their way to hell because you are trying to work your way to God. You're asking God to save you, but you're trying to help him. And I want to tell you, friend, he can't use your help. God must do it for you and he must do it alone. There are people all over this congregation, listen, you're trying and scratching and fighting and you're so practical and so pragmatic that that you want to believe God, you want to trust God, but hard experience has taught you, i got to do something. I've got to fix this. And let me just tell you, part of God's winning your heart is to shift you, shift you, shift you. From your power to his power. From self-sufficiency to God's sufficiency. To God, I'm going to help you. To God, I'm utterly helpless. I'm trusting you to do for me what I can't do for myself. God loves Jacob. God loves this manipulator. 
He loves this trickster. He's after his heart. And I think Jacob has grown increasingly miserable. He's got all these flocks and all these herds, but his problems with his daddy and his problems with his brother and his problems with Laban and his problems in his family have all mounted up. And he's trying now to control every bit of it. And listen, gripping all those things gets so tiresome. But he doesn't know what to do. And friend, God's going to do it for him. God's going to change his heart. Let's see what happens. Genesis 32, if you turn over there with me. Genesis 32. I'm going to read quickly, so you listen quickly. I, I don't even know what that means, but try it. Genesis 32, verse 3. Now, here's the deal. Laban says, all right, you go your way, I'll go my way. I mean, they have, they've reached like boiling point, okay? And, and, and now Jacob wants to go back home, but there's a real problem with going back home. Guess who's back home? Esau. It's been a lot of years, and Jacob hopes the water's under the bridge, but he's not so sure. Genesis chapter 32 and verse 3, all the stuff he tried to control was still out of control. Verse 3. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau his brother into the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there till now, and I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I may find grace in thy sight. Notice how political he is. Say to my lord Esau, right? He's all formal and, and beautiful and, well, look at the six. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and he also cometh to meet thee. He's on his way. And 400 men are with him. That ain't good news. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands, and he said, if Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. You see what he's doing? He's still controlling, still manipulating, still playing the chess game, okay? I'll divide all my stuff into two camps, and if he hits the one camp, maybe the other camp can get away. All right? Verse 9, and Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, the Lord which sayest unto me, return to thy country, to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies, of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I'm become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And you said, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Notice what he's doing. God is changing his heart. God is bringing him to the point where he's more dependent. But look what he does right after the prayer, verse 13. And he lodged there that same night, and he took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau, his brother. 200 she-goats, 20 he-goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milch camels with their colts, 40 kine, 10 bulls, 20 donkeys, 10 foals. He delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves, and said to his servants, pass over before me and put a space between drove and drove. Get what he's doing. And he commanded the foremost, saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you, ask, saying, whose art thou, and whither goest thou, and whose are these before thee? Then thou shalt say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau, and behold, also he is behind us. And so commanded he the second and the third, and all that followed the drove, saying, On this manner shall you speak unto Esau when you find him. And say ye moreover, Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us, for he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he will accept of me. So went the present over before him, and himself lodged that night in the company. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And let's stop right there just a minute. I'm going to put phase after phase of gift. I'm going to have like a whole little section there of gifts for him. And when he asks, what's all this? We'll say, 
this is from Jacob. He's just back there. He wanted to give you this. And then when he goes a little further, another set of gifts and another set of... And do you see what he's doing still? God, I'm asking you to save me. And the chess game goes on. I've got to control it. I've got to make it happen. I've got to manipulate. And finally, he leaves his family on one side of the river, Jabbok, and verse 24, Jacob was left alone. Alone with all his fear. And alone with the fact that this is completely beyond his control. Friend, listen to me. I don't care how good you are, how much you can work everything out in life, how much you are able to manipulate people and smooth them into what you want. The day will come if you're a follower of Jesus Christ where you are as helpless as a child and you are alone. And then the story takes a turn that we would have never thought or invented or come up with ourselves in a hundred million years. I want to read the whole thing and then we're going to unpack it a little bit. 24. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he, the man, saw that he prevailed not against Jacob, The man touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And the man said, let me go, for the day is breaking. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And Jacob said, and the Hebrew is strong, it means whispered, Jacob. And the man said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? Why are you asking my name, Jacob? You know who I am. And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, or Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted or limped upon his thigh. If you're like me, and that's the first time, or at least for me, the first time I read that, you're like, what in the world just happened? Jacob's alone contemplating his fate when an individual shows up and wrestles him to the ground. I've heard it speculated that this individual was an angel. That's a possibility. But I have to be honest with you, I believe this was much more than an angel. I believe this is what theologians call a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ himself. Why do I believe that? Because he named that place the face of God. I have seen the face of God. So what does this mean? That Jacob quite literally was being wrestled by God. And contrary to what the text might look in first read, Jacob was not the aggressor. Christ was the aggressor. Christ took him down to the ground. And every time Jacob tried to get up and run, Christ brought him back down. Christ wrestled him back down. Hour after hour after hour. Notice verse thir- chapter 32, verse 24. It didn't say he wrestled with a man. It said a man wrestled with him. Here's Jacob still trying to work, still trying to get away, still trying to run, still trying to come up with some way to make it happen. But he can't. 
hour after hour after hour all night long he gets up to run and he's pinned he gets up to move and he's thrown he gets up to get away and he can't what's happening Old habits, my friends, die hard. Jacob has always been able to rely on his natural abilities, but not this time. And as dawn is drawing near, and Jacob's energy is waning, he is becoming more and more aware, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm too weak. I can't go on. friend. Anybody been in here long enough that you could testify there are moments in life where you can't do anything but just hang on? What is God doing? He is making Jacob aware of his weakness. You can't win this one. In verse 24, finally... Jacob is touched at the hollow of his thigh. Most commentators agree this is the place where the hip socket is. And with a touch of God's finger, Jacob's hip is literally put out of socket. This would have made it impossible for him to rest rest any longer, for him to fight any longer, for him to run any longer. And here's the deal. God could have stopped this at any moment, but he didn't. He waited. He was patient. He let it go on and on and on. And then in his time, he touches him. He stops him. He breaks him. He prunes him. Jacob is brought to the end of his own resources. He has struck him at the very point of his strength. I want you to look at 26 one more time. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. He said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And he said unto him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. We're at a point now, listen, Jacob isn't running anymore. He's not fighting anymore. He's not struggling anymore. All he's doing is clinging He is hanging on. Hosea 12.4 tells us that he is weeping his heart out as he says, God, I can't go forward anymore like this. I can't go on anymore like this. I don't have the power. I don't have the strength. I'm so tired. I'm so weak. I'm going to hang on to you you, till you bless me. I'm going to die if you don't bless me. And it's right here that God says, what's your name? I said it from this pulpit before, let me say it again. God never asks questions for information. He knows what his name is. What's your name? Tell me your name. And he whispers it. I'm Jacob. I'm the trickster. I'm the manipulator. I'm the cheat. That's what I am, God. No excuses, no blame, no shifting responsibility. For the first time in his life, he owns it. And he confesses it out loud. That's what I am. I want you to get God's reply because it's beautiful. Thy name shall be no more called Jacob. You're not the trickster anymore. Your new name is Israel, which means God commands. For as a prince hast thou contended with God and with men and hast prevailed. And listen, if you, don't, if you don't read this right, you'll think, okay, he hung on long enough to wrestle a blessing out of God. If you're just belligerent enough, he beat God. Friend, here's the thing. Jacob didn't beat God. He beat Jacob. He finally beat the trickster. 
he finally beat the manipulator when he owned up to what he was and he learned to cling instead of fight. He had contended for the birthright, someone wrote, and had succeeded. He had contended for the blessing and had succeeded. He had contended with Laban and had succeeded. He had contended with men and succeeded. Now he contends with God and he fails. Thus his new name was changed to Israel. God commands to teach him the greatly needed lesson of dependence upon God. And here's the deal, listen. He gets up and he's wounded. Life has wounded him. The battle has wounded him. He's going to bear that scar. He's going to have that limp for the rest of his life. But here's the thing he doesn't understand. After all the fighting, all the manipulating, all the trying, all the working, all the worrying, I'm going to try my best to do something with my brother Esau and make it happen. He learns out something, or he figures out something. God hadn't just touched Jacob's hip. He had been touching Esau's heart. And when Esau meets up with Jacob, he says, oh, brother, that stuff's history. It's all forgiven. He said, preacher, what does that have for me? Listen, if you're here this morning, and I believe this is all of us in our own way, if, if you belong to Jesus Christ, God has got you on a journey to reclaim your heart from your idols And one of the main areas he's going to reclaim your heart is in this area of control, this area of self-sufficiency, this area of manipulation. I wonder if there's somebody here today who would just get honest with God and say, God, that's me. I've been trying to make all this stuff happen with my family, but I can't. You're God. God, that's me. I've been trying to make my circumstances work out, and I'm fighting and clawing and cheating and doing shady business deals to try to make my finances work. But God, I'm a trickster. I'm a manipulator, and it's wrong. I'm looking to you. God, I've been worrying day and night, trying to be God and shoulder all these responsibilities. But God, I'm weary of it. I'm a Jacob. Forgive me. I want to trust you. I think most all of us, before it's all said and done, we're going to come out of this thing with a limp. This stuff doesn't die easy. But thanks be to God, He's that merciful. He will change you from what you are to one that can truly know Him and worship and follow Him. Would you stand with me? We said at the outset of this message that some would say, Pastor, because of my present circumstances, the spots that I find myself in, I'm stuck in a number of areas in life. I just don't think I have God's favor. I just think I've sinned it all away. Frank, can I tell you, out of love, he'll put you in spots. He'll put you in a job you can't work your way out of. He'll put you in a relationship where everything goes wrong and you can't do anything to change it. He will place you out of love in circumstances where your heart is detached from your power, your glory, and your kingdom and comes to trust God. Listen, somebody in this place, you're so clever, you're so good at this, you've learned to win with people, you know how to make it work, man. I'm telling you, when the Holy God gets after you, He's going to bring you to the place of dependence He said, what do I do with all that? Embrace him. Refuse to let him go. Own up to what you are and what you've done. And this God's not out to harm you, friend. He's out to make you. He is making you. Something extraordinary for his glory. So this morning we come to that pivot moment.
for some of you, God has drawn your heart right now to stop fighting and running and working and doing and maybe get flat on your face before him and let God be God. I don't know what your need is. I know what mine is. I don't know where your sin lies. I know where mine lies. But let's take some time right now. It'll pass very quickly to talk to our God and get real with him. If you need to come pray here at the front, you come on. If you need to come with your wife or a family member or grab some brother or sister in Christ by the hand and come on, please do. If you need someone to pray for you, you come on down this morning. We'll find somebody to pray for you. If you need to pray right there in your seat, God will hear you right there from your seat. But if you need to move, you come on and move. Let's pray. We give this time to him. We're going to get real quiet. Please, no unnecessary leaving or moving around during this time. It's more critical than anything we've done when we get silent and alone before God. Gracious Lord, we come before you now, thanking you for who you are and what you do. Soften our hearts. Pursue us relentlessly, God, even when it hurts. And help our hearts to belong to you. Bless the one who's fighting. Oh, God, I pray today they'll have a breakthrough with you. And, Father, for the one who doesn't know your son, Jesus Christ, they need a profound change of heart where they can love you and follow you. Change them today. Let them call on your voice this very day. It's in Christ's name we ask all these things. Amen.